Hi there, it's Dr. Ryan, and today we're going to continue the second part of optimizing thyroid function. And this is a two part video. And in this part, we're going to focus more on the labs and therapy section and my approach as to how I try to optimize thyroid function for my patients over at the clinic. Okay, so let's go back to our um, presentation here. All right, so where we left off, uh, basically, we were talking a little bit about the physical exam signs of poor uh, thyroid function. And we noticed that um, you can get periorbital edema, uh, secondary to the mucin deposition, mixed edema underneath the eyelids or in other areas of the body, uh, coarse dry hair, the lateral third of your eyebrows become sparse and uh, lose fullness, you know, puffy face. And then of course you can get uh, keratinoderma, which is basically the, beta, the deposition of beta carotene in the skin owing to the fact that it's not being converted to vitamin D in a poor in a state in which thyroid hormones are optimized, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about laboratory values that I look at when evaluating a patient who comes to the clinic. So the major labs I look at are thyroid simulating hormone, uh, which uh, is somewhat useful, but it's more, I find, what I find to be more useful is free T3 and free T4, which are more accurate markers of how much active thyroid hormone is present versus the hormone that is being released by the hypothalamus to act on the or rather by the pituitary to act on the thyroid. Now, um, also of note is reverse T3. Of course, this is the hormone that's produced that is um, converted from T4 and it can bind to the T3 receptors, but not really have much of an effect in terms of increasing metabolism and improving body temperature, much like T3. So essentially blocks the effects of T3. We don't want too much of this. Thyroid globulin, T, uh, thyroid peroxidase, and TSH receptor antibodies. And ideally, we want to uh, see very little of these present. They're very common in disorders like Hashimoto's thyroiditis. A CBC and CMP to get a baseline for a patient's hemoglobin, hematocrit, white blood cell count, red blood cell indices, as well as any electrolytes, their glucose levels, and liver function tests. In terms of nutritional status, I tend to look at iron ferritin, which is, uh, which is useful, but it is an acute phase reactant. So it can rise during stressed or states where patients are stressed or, uh, or infectious states. So I always make sure to get total iron, iron and iron binding capacity, as well as iron saturation to get a better idea of their body iron stores. And then iron, as well as B12 and folate are important in formation of T4 to T3 because they're important um, uh, they're important in the deiodinase enzymes that are key in converting T4 to T3 in the periphery. And then of course with inflammation, uh, we there are some markers such as CRP and homocysteine which are uh, important and in inflamed states it's sometimes quite it, the production of T4 to T3 is decreased and there is more of production of T4 or conversion of T4 to reverse T3 in these states. We wanna make sure that uh, we try to reduce inflammation as, as much as possible. In terms of diet, well, some general uh, advice that I use, again, owing to the fact that we want to reduce gut inflammation as much as possible, is try to move towards less processed foods, so eliminate refined sugars, gluten, dairy, nightshade vegetables. And not all patients will develop allergies or uh, get some sort of inflammation secondary to these, but many do. And a really simple way to evaluate uh, your reaction to these is to do a test where you move uh, these vegetables from your diet for about two to three weeks and then slowly reinstitute, reinstitute them. And if you notice any symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome or poor digestion start to come back, well, you have your answer. 
You want to avoid saturated fats and processed seed oils and use uh, nuts and olive oil and MCT oil, macadamia nut oil for your fat sources as these the saturated fats and processed seed oils tend to worsen insulin sensitivity and the omega-6 to omega-3 or omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is more um, favorable to merge omega-6, which is not good. You want to have a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, and that's found with processed seed oils such as sesame seed and sesame seed oil and canola oil. There should be a focus on lean protein uh, to help build skeletal muscle. Uh, I am a fan of animal protein, but uh, there can be complete proteins that have a, co a combination of certain vegetable sources. Just be careful of the amount of carbohydrates you ingest when you do so. And then finally, in terms of making sure glycogen stores are full, you want to utilize complex carbs rather than simple carbohydrates. Things like gluten-free carbohydrates, such as rice, quinoa, buckwheat, yams, and you usually want to them earlier in the day as your metabolism is, is tends to be higher during those time periods. Um, this can help you in terms of improving metabolism, uh, help facilitate uh, resistance training, which again will be very useful um, overall, not just in terms of improving thyroid function. You do want to utilize certain vitamin and mineral therapies. So the main vitamins that you want to supplement are vitamin A, B complex, D and K, um, and the key uh, and the B vitamins are very key, in particular uh, in um, improving the conversion of T4 to T3. Is there a key in those deiodinases? De uh, and then Vitamin D and vitamin K are important for calcium absorption as well as calcium deposition in bone. Selenium is, an, is, an, is really key in terms of thyroid function. There are many selenoproteins, the D iodinases, along with um, many of the proteins involved in thyroid hormone production in uh, the colloid uh, back in the thyroid gland are, are based upon a selenium. Uh, magnesium is really key because introduction of thyroid hormone uh, can lead to arrhythmias and uh, having appropriate magnesium levels can prevent this. Um, zinc is important in terms of deiodinase function. And of course, appropriate iodine levels are, are useful as well. You can get many of these from a good multivitamin. Although I have found that most multivitamin, this is one of the multivitamins I recommend pure encapsulations, but there's many out there. Um, I have noticed that they don't tend to have enough B-complex vitamins as well as vitamin D and vitamin K. Um, so those would be, and certainly magnesium, those would be ones that I would try to supplement outside of a good uh, multivitamin. And then of course, in terms of therapy, um, the main sorts of therapy that we utilize are natural desiccated hormone, and liothyronine or T3. I usually start with natural desiccated hormone, which essentially is just um, processed thyroid gland from animals, most commonly uh, porcine uh, thyroid, so from pigs, because they immunologically, they are very similar. That, hence, that's why they're used uh, in many other aspects of, of medicine. For example, with heparin, uh, which is a blood thinning medication, along with uh, to produce valves. Um, they, the good thing about natural desiccated hormone is it tends to include both T3 and T4 along with uh, T0 through T2, which are thyroid hormones that we are recognizing have some additional function outside of T3 and T4. They also contain thyroglobulin, which will, helps in terms of absorption, thyroglobulin, T4, is it's very difficult. It, well, it tends to get degraded pretty easily in the GI tract and thyroglobulin seems to prevent this to a certain extent. T3 is readily absorbed. And um, it also contains calcitonin, which can be useful in improving uh, bone deposition, calcium 
It helps reduce the osteoclast activity in bones and maintain calcium stores within bones. So that's something that another benefit of taking NDH. And most of my patients, we start around 60 milligrams, although some patients need 90. There is a subset of patients that when we utilize uh, MP thyroid, they tend to convert too much over to reverse T3. Oftentimes there are other reasons they're uh, in the state, their inflammatory state is not being reduced. In other words, they're certain, doing certain things that are causing low level um, inflammation, pr primarily their diet, or perhaps their iron stores are a bit low. After correcting those things, uh, some patients still tend to um, convert too much to reverse T3. So I, what I try to do in that case is create a, or utilize a formulation with more T3 in it than T4. Natural desiccated hormone has a four to one ratio approximately of T4 to T3, which is how it's released in the body. Um, so in a typical dosage of 60 milligrams NP thyroid, that's 38 micrograms of T4 and nine micrograms of T3. However, uh, certain patients tend to do much better just on liothyronine by itself. Liothyronine is readily absorbed by the GI tract. You just have to be a little more careful in terms of dosing um, because it does have a short half-life and uh, typically patients on T3 only will require twice daily dosing. And usually um, something like five to 10 milligrams twice daily seems to do the trick. It's not five to 10 micrograms twice daily seems to do the trick. And then there's, then there's the question of T4 only. There are many patients do well on Synthroid. However, um, in the functional medicine and anti-aging world, we tend to uh, shy away from T4 only owing to the fact that if you just introduce um, T4 or levothyroxine, you run the risk of introducing a bunch of hormone that doesn't have nearly the activity of T3. It's about 20% of the activity of T3. And uh, in a patient that has poorly optimized thyroid hormone, the likelihood of it being converted to T3 is low owing to poor deiodinase um, activity. So it's best to probably start with something that combines both of them. Okay. Well, that pretty much sums up the um, presentation on optimizing thyroid function. So I hope this has been helpful for you and uh, maybe elucidate some of the questions you had and how anti-aging and functional medicine physicians look at thyroid hormone.